And uh, today we are very honoured to have Dr Ng, uh, Ng Wai Chong here. So let's start the morning puja and then we will continue with the talk. Okay, so preliminary homage to the Buddha. Let us pay homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Offerings, please put our palms together to partake in the offerings to the Buddha. The offering of the five items allows us to express our gratitude to the Buddha and serves as a symbol to help us remember the teachings. Let's join wholeheartedly and read the verses together. Offering of light. Light symbolizes wisdom. May the light of Dharma dispel the darkness of ignorance. Offering of incense. Incense symbolizes the fragrance of pure moral conduct. This reminds us to cultivate good conduct. Offering of water. Water symbolizes purity, clarity and calmness. It reminds us to practice the Buddha's teachings to cleanse one's mind, which is full of desires, ill will and delusion, to attain the state of purity. Offering of fruits. Fruits symbolize the ultimate fruit of enlightenment, which is our goal. They also remind us that all actions will have their effects. Offering of flowers. Flowers symbolize impermanence. The freshness, fragrance and beauty of flowers are impermanent. This reminds us that we should all live in the present. Remembering thus, we should reduce our craving and attachment. Now let's do the salutation to the Triple Gem. Let us pay respects to the Triple Gem. Arahang Samma Sambuddho Bhagava Buddhang Bhagavantang Abhivademi Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhammang Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami Going for refuge, let's chant the verses for taking the three refuges. Buddha Saranangachami Dhammang saranam gacchami Sangham saranam gacchami Dutyampi buddham saranam gacchami Dutyampi dhammam saranam gacchami Dutyampi sangham saranam gacchami Tatiyam pi buddhang saranang gachami Tatiyam pi damang saranang gachami 
Tatiampi sanggang saranang gachami. The five precepts. Let's chant these verses to ob observe the five precepts. Panyatipata veramani sika padang samadiyami. Adinadana veramani sika padang samadiyami. Kame sumichachara veramani sika padang samadiyami. Musavada veramani sika padang samadiyami. Sura meraya majapamadatana veramani sika padang samadiyami. Recollection of the Buddha. Let us recollect the sublime qualities of the Buddha. Iti piso bhagawa arahang sama sambuto vijajarana sampano sugato loka vidu anutaro puri sarati Sata Deva Manusanam Buddha Bhagavati. Recollection of the Dhamma. Let us recollect the sublime qualities of the Dhamma. Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Sanditiko Akaliko Ehipasiko O Panaiko Pachata Vedita Bovinuhiti. Recollection of the Sangha. Let us recollect the sublime qualities of the Sangha. Supati Pano Bhagavato Savaka Sango. Uju Patipano Bhagavato Savakasango Nyaya Patipano Bhagavato Savakasango Samichi Patipano Bhagavato Savakasango Yaditang Chattari Purisa Yugani Ata Purisa Pugala Esa Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Ahuneyo Pahuneyo Dakineyo Anjali Karaniyo Nutarang punya ketang loka sati. Sadu, sadu, sadu. And now let us do announcements. Okay, VFUs this Saturday, again, do come for the fantastic lineup of activities that the youths have lined up for us. So do come, and you have youths uh, in uh, tertiary, sec uh, sorry, yeah, tertiary uh, education. Please do join us on Saturdays. And um, do come also for our Sunday service. Okay, we have fantastic lineup of talks as well. Uh, this week, we are very honoured to have Dr. Ng today. And next week, we are going to have Dr. Kenneth and also uh, Brother Taiwi and um, Venerable Santa Chito will also be uh, giving talks. So do tune in on our Sunday service. Next week's Sunday service will be uh, Dr. Kenneth Tan. Uh, he hasn't given a topic yet, so... Um, we await with bated breath and uh, do join in the excitement of finding out what he's going to talk about. Rahula Connects, 
for ages 7 to 9 and 10 to 12 uh, is open for registration. So do register if you have children in that age group. And our BF Junior Youth for uh, young youths from the ages of 13 to 16 will be on Saturday, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Also, a fantastic lineup of talks, activities, and they're very vibrant. They go for exciting activities. So do join them if you're interested. BFE Yin Yoga will be, um, is, uh, for meditation, will be open from 16 March to 18 May 2021. So interested, do please register as well. And today, we are very, very delighted, very honoured to have Dr. Ng Wai Chong to give us a talk on the Samania Pala Sutta DN2. Uh, his slides are very beautiful and fantastic, so I am um, very interested in looking at his slides. And um, may I now just read a short... Um, uh, I think we start with the meditation, right? Okay, so we'll start in the meditation and then I will introduce Dr. Ng with a bio. So let us start with um, the short recording of Ajahn Brahm's meditation. Let us close our eyes and find ourselves in a comfortable position. Before, be complete. Maybe not. Okay, well, I'm going to do that, the sweeping meditation, which is a really nice meditation to get people who have never meditated before. It's going to be completely led by me. So you don't have to do a thing. So, you're sitting down, cross-legged, close your eyes, and just settle yourself into the meditation posture. And just make peace with everything which happens. The young kid cries, it's wonderful. You know, that's what kids do. <laughs> they have to understand and accept. Now as you're sitting there, can you feel your toes now? Are there any sensations there? If you can't connect with your toes, just wiggle them slightly. So you can pick up a feeling in your toes. And when you've picked up that feeling, when you have that connection between your mind and your toes, you can feel a sensation there then send compassion and kindness along that connection. You're just warming and easing your toes with kindness until you f start to feel the sensations become feelings of relaxation. You're deliberately relaxing your toes until you feel a soft tingling sensation to know your toes are in the maximum possible relaxed state. Then move your attention to your feet, the uppers, the soles, and all that's in between. Can you notice any feelings or sensations in your feet? Could be warm, pressure, tingling, itching, or whatever. Any sensation will do. That connects you to your feet. And then send kindness there. Send compassion. Wishing your feet to be comfortable. You feel your feet relaxing, just like when you lay down in bed at night. The tension in the body eases as you sink into the soft mattress. Just imagine your feet sinking into the softest of pillows, relaxing, easing, coming to a state of comfort. Picking up the feeling and through compassion, softening the feeling. And then move the attention to your lower legs not just the back muscles, the calves, but also the bones and the skin. Can you pick up a sensation in your lower legs? Whatever sensation it is, is enough to begin with. And from there, send kindness. 
May my lower legs be at peace. Be in comfort. And your mindfulness should start becoming strong enough to notice the sensations change slightly to become more comfortable, more at ease. As you're deliberately relaxing each part of the body one by one. And when your lower legs are relaxed, go to your knees. Many people these days have problems in their knees. Can you notice any sensation at all in the area around your knees? If you can't feel one, imagine one. And then when you have connected with your knees, send kindness there. May my knees be at peace. May they relax. And soon you get a feeling of relaxation. When any tightness is eased. And then you go to your thighs. Can you notice sensation in your thighs, including your bottom? The bottom feeling is hard to relax because it's pressed against the floor or the cushion or the chair. Nevertheless, you can pick up a feeling there. Send kindness. Send kindness to those sensations until you feel they relax a bit more. Relaxing the muscles and the bones and the skin in your thighs and bottom. Can you feel the sensations there? Be kind to them until all that part of your body feels at ease. You're relaxing to the max. Feel it all get so soft and comfortable. And then move your attention to your waist. And in your waist, it's not just the outside, it's the inside with your colon. Many people have digestive problems these days, from tension. Just imagine that whole part of your body, the waist inside, the lower back bones. Can you notice sensations there? Deliberately send kindness, compassion, And feel those sensations relax until they become so peaceful, so comfortable. Even your colon, the digestive tract, imagine that just relaxing. It's not that hard when you pick up a sensation to relax it. You have feedback. You find what it takes by an intention of the mind to bring more peace, softness, ease to that part of the body. And that feedback teaches you how to relax. You deliberately relax the muscles in your colon and around your waist and even the bones in that part of the backbone. Now you sweep the attention further up your torso. You can get to the intestines, the higher part of the di digestive tract. Or it may be your kidneys, your liver. If you have any problem in that area, imagine the sensation. Pick up a feeling there. That means you have made contact. And when you've made contact with a f part of the body in that area, send kindness there. If you have, say, kidney problem, feel any sensation in that area of the body. Connect and with kindness bring ease and comfort. 
So if everything expands and gets soft and easy, the combination of mindfulness and compassion is extremely powerful. You move the feelings up the body, move them up to your chest area. Some people have problems with their heart, with their lungs, or with women, with their breasts, with cancers. Can you notice any sensation in that part of the body? Pick up any sensation that connects your mindfulness to that area of the body. And just add kindness to relax, to ease, to soothe. If you imagine that hard place in your breast expanding, easing, softening, dissolving through kindness. You can experience a feeling getting softer, more relaxed, as the tension drains away. Even in your heart or your lungs, tension, tightness, draining. As you pick up the sensations there, and through compassion, relax. You can go up to your shoulders now. Can you pick up a sensation in the area of your shoulders? Notice that sensation. Be aware of it. Connect and add compassion to relax those shoulders. Bring them ease and peace. As if again they were sinking into the softest of cushions. <sighs> until they feel so relaxed. Now, is there any feelings and sensations in your arms or your hands? Just imagine both arms. Notice the sensations there and be kind to them so that they too relax and you feel this experience of relaxation between your whole body, down from the shoulders, the arms, the torso, the bottom and the legs, as you deliberately relaxed every part. Now you go to your head. Start with the muscles in the face. Can you notice any sensations there? Once you've contacted those sensations with your mindfulness, Along that line of communication, send your kindness. So you feel the muscles in your face relaxing, the tightness dissolving. You feel every muscle in the face relax, relax, relax. You feel it tingle, tingle with comfort and ease, the tingle of peace. Now you move your attention to a few inches behind your face, to your brain. It's hard to pick up real sensations from the brain, but just imagine them with all of your anxieties and fears and memories and even difficulties right now. Imagine that brain as being tired. Connect with your brain and send kindness. It's as if that grey matter behind your eyes is now getting your TLC, your tender loving kindness. As you relax your brain, bring it to a state of ease and comfort. Through this little sweeping method, you've relaxed your whole body. 
but at the same time you be mindful and kind. You're in the present moment and you're probably not thinking very much. This is what we mean by meditation. How do you feel now? What's it like inside? This is what we mean by meditation. The beautiful peace of a kind, calm body and mind. Okay, so you can come out of your meditation now. Okay, brothers and sisters, you can open your eyes. Uh, thank you all for coming again. Uh, may we invite uh, Dr. Ng Wai Chong up? Okay, uh, let me introduce him with a bio. Dr. Ng Wai Chong is a medical doctor with a, non, with a local non-profit organization. He has been an active volunteer with the NUS Medical Dharma Circle since 1988 and was the immediate past president of Chakavala Meditation Center. He studies the Dharma and meditation under Sayale Dipankara, a disciple of the Venerable Pakor Sayadaw. In the past few years, he has been invited to deliver talks at the Singapore Buddhist Federation, the Buddhist Fellowship, Gong Meng San Bokaksi, Buddha Light International Association and other Buddhist organizations in Singapore, and also the Brown Center, and also a welcome speaker in other organizations, um, and other many other organizations. Uh, I've seen your profiles everywhere on the internet. <laughs> uh, Dr. Ng is also the founder and CEO of NWC Longevity Practice, Private Limited, is a social enterprise startup that provides consultancy and clinical services. He was also the former Chief Clinical Affairs of South Foundation and still holding a position there. Dr. Ng has been very selfless. He's devoted to the Dharma, he's devoted to the elderly, and he's without question a real Kayanamita to all who meets him. So without further delay, and I present Dr. Ng Wai Chong. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Hey, thank you, Hikim, for the kind introduction. So uh, thank you, Buddhist Fellowship and uh, Sister Hikim for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to, um, to perform something meritorious on a Sunday, uh, sharing of the Dhamma, the Buddha's teachings. So when I was... Uh... Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so when I was asked to share on the Dhamma, it's like sometimes you don't know what to share, you know. I mean, most of the things have been covered. And, uh, but I like to share the Dhamma. It's a good thing to do. Um, it's not just so much that I have something to teach. It's really more that, you know, the Buddha's teaching is so beautiful. And uh, it's so nice if we can talk about it, discuss about it, remind ourselves around about it. Um, so sometimes we can play the role of an audience, sometimes we can play the role of a person sharing the teachings. And so I say yes, and, uh, but what to talk about? So like Kenneth, I know how he felt, you know, <laughs> to be confirmed, <laughs> because he really don't have the time to think, but um, so... I believe he will just prepare maybe like the day before he comes. <laughs> and then when he comes, we just talk, you know, he can talk very well. So, but for me, um, I didn't know what to say. And I, I realized, of course, we need to publicize and, you know, uh, um, attract people to partake in this. So I just don't know why I just say Samana Palasutta. Because many years ago, when I read uh, Maurice Bosch's translation of the Diga Nikaya, this second sutta affected me the most. I remember I was moved to tears. I didn't fully understand what it, what it was teaching, but there was, it was like a story. He was telling a story, and then he was uh, sharing something to inspire 
somebody who was grief-stricken, of course, remorse-stricken, full of guilt. And, um, and then he was sharing with him the beauty of a pure life. And uh, Ajata Satu was so touched. And so when I was reading, I was so moved, even though I don't understand what he was saying. So many, many years later, so when I read that book, I think I was still a medical student uh, in the 80s or maybe early 90s. I think it was the 80s. And, um, but now looking back, it has a lot of meaning to me as well. So I just like to share this as if it is a book club. Okay. Um, share with you the sutta. My reference is mainly uh, the commentary compiled by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Um, he translated the sutta as well as the commentary. And then the main sutta, I, I use uh, Maurice Walsh translation. And my, I also did some research on uh, Wikipedia, which used mostly the works of uh, Rambo Tani Sarobiku, as well as uh, something on YouTube from the Sri Lankan. And uh, um, yeah, some of the videos are really good. So I'm just sharing with you Samana Polap Sutta. And you know, um, pictures, uh, many of them are copyrighted, so I have to draw myself. So um, using iPad. Okay, so this is Ajata Satu in front of the Buddha, Samana Palla. So Samana um, means, uh, you see, in the ancient um, India, right, uh, you have the Brahmanas and the Samanas. The Brahmanas are people who follow the Vedic tradition. They have a, of course, the, the Vedic teachings is also a very um, rich and deep. Uh, collection of teachings, and uh, but generally they believe in some kind of a creator God and an ultimate soul, and uh, um, they they also believe in karma and the uh, life after death. They call it the reincarnation, and once you're finally purified, you can be one with the ultimate soul, the Atma, right? So that's the Brahmana's tradition. It is the mainstream belief in ancient India. Okay. So in uh, the Brahmana tradition, you have the, the highest of the caste, the Brahmins. And then, uh, but of course, if you're from the Sakyan clan, you think that Sakya is the highest. So Sakya, Brahmins, um, Vai, Vai Sharks, I think, and then the Sudras, and then the Untouchables, the, those who are outcasts. Um, so represent the religion, the, the imperialist the empire, and then the capitalist, the trade, <laughs> the merchants, and then the the workers, the mass, okay? Um, so that was the, the Brahmana's tradition. But Samana, Samana's tradition were there before even the Brahmans. I remember reading long ago in history when I was in secondary two that uh, how the, uh, the, the India um, development in the Indus Valley started when the Aryans came, right? From somewhere in, in the Central Asians. So it brought the Aryans thinking and ideologies here and that's I think were where the Brahmanas tradition started but before they arrived there are already Samanas. Samanas are people who practice different way of trying to uh, to get the best out of life so that it is most meaningful but of course they have got many um, uh, views and opinions so um, I'm just wondering whether the current word shamans is comes from samanas. But the you know the, the Sanskrit tradition and the Latin and all that they have, they are sort of like a similar group of language, right? So maybe it is. Uh, so samanas were groups of different disparate um, teachings uh, that was outside the Brahmana schools. Buddha's teachings, the Buddha is one of the samanas. Okay? So, um, so pala means fruit. So samanas are people who follow a spiritual existence. So generally, you can call them the homeless. Um, they follow the. They are like recluses. You know, they follow the spiritual pure life. Some are. If you go to um, Varanasi, even now nowadays in the Ganges, you see also people with matted hair. They put ashes on the body, and the ashes are actually cremated ashes, you know, and some of them are naked. I haven't seen the naked aesthetics, but I've seen 
in I've been to Varanasi a few times. So uh, sometimes when you see them, oh, it's such a nice you know photo to take. So uh, so you, you see still see many of them. So these are the sadhus. Um, or the siddhas or the samanas. So the Buddha was one of them. So the samana in this particular case, uh, Maurice Walsh translates as the homeless, whereas um, in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, he called it the recluses, also, or the um, ascetics. So samana pala is the fruit of the homeless life. So um, the Dika Nikaya is long, and generally Dika Nikaya, the long discourse of the Buddha, um, you know the Sutta Pitaka, you got the long discourses, middle length discourses, the Sangita Nikaya, the Anguttara Nikaya, and then the Kudaka Nikaya, where the um, it's even bigger than any of them. So, but the, in the Dika Nikaya, generally, the teachings tend to talk about different sectarians during the Buddha's times. And uh, sometimes you wonder, the teachings um, recorded by the Dika Nikaya readers during the ancient times, um, they seem to be um, targeting the non-Buddhists, people who are outside the sasana. Um, so, uh, um, so there are many stories, narratives, you know. So um, this particular one was very interesting. It was a night, a full moon night on uh, maybe the fourth month, Kambali, I think. Um, and King Ajatasattu uh, was sitting on his balcony looking at the moonlight. He was so delighted. Then he said, delightful friends, is this moonlight night. Charming is this moonlight night. Auspicious is this moonlight night. Can we not today visit some ascetic or Brahmin to visit whom would be being, bring peace to our heart? Actually, instead of our, he might have just used the word my heart. So the history of Ajat Sattu, so um, for those of you who are not aware, he was the son of King Bimbisara. King Bimbisara was the king of Rajakaha. So he was a good friend from, uh, of the Buddha. Even the Buddha, um, according to Thich Nhat Hanh's um, Old Path White Cloud, right? The Buddha and King Bimbisara met even before the Buddha became a Buddha. So they were good friends. And, uh, and King Bimbisara, subsequently, after the Buddha taught him, he became a stream enterer. So he was... He has got a pure heart. And, um, and apparently, Ajata Satu, when the queen was pregnant with him, he had a, she had a strong thirst to drink the king's blood. And, uh, and apparently, there are some uh, ancient seers during that time who were saying that the person who is going to be born will be the enemy of the king. Okay. So Ajata Satu, Satu means uh, enemy. Ajata is not yet born, the unborn enemy. So during that time when the queen was pregnant with Ajata Satu, he wanted, she wanted to drink the queen, king's blood. But the king, he, she didn't dare to tell the king. And she had no appetite for anything. So she became very scrawny and weak. And the king was a very kind king, Bimisara. So he asked his wife, but the wife didn't want to say. Subsequently, the wife did tell him. And then... Um, he actually got uh, a knife to cut his, his elbow so that there are some blood mixed with water and the wife drank. And then, um, yeah, the wife also tried her best to have an abortion, actually, because of the serious advice. And, uh, but it was not successful. And uh, after, after the baby was born, she wanted to kill the baby because of the serious thinking that this baby will be the enemy of the king. But King Bimbisara said, no. Um, king Bimbisara has a lot of love. And um, so anyway, subsequently, after the baby was born, the mother and the child, uh, because of mother's instinct, of course, continued to love the child and, and brought up the, um, the prince, uh, Ajata Satu. And unfortunately, he was influenced by Devatatta. Devatatta, as we all know, was the Buddha's um, disciple, but also somebody who harbor evil intent on the Buddha. So he he plotted to 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 to, to sort of um, bring King Ajata, Prince Ajata Satu into his of his influence through psychic powers, um, and uh, um, and 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 Ajata Satu influenced by Devatatta 
And Devadatta said that you should kill your father so that you can become the king, you know. And uh, somehow Ajatasattu decided to follow his teacher's advice. Okay? And, uh, but instead of killing, he wanted to starve the king. So put him, he asked the king to relinquish his throne to him. The king said, okay, so you shall be the king. But after that, um, Ajata Sattu thought, maybe I don't have to kill my father. So went back to Devatata. Yeah, I'm, I'm now the king. I don't need to kill my father anymore. But Devatata was not satisfied. You have to kill your father. So Ajata Sattu didn't feel to kill him, but put him into a prison to starve him. But the queen visited him regularly in the prison, hiding food either in the dress or somewhere to give to the king. Until for so long the king wasn't dead, so Ajata Satu banned the queen from visiting, and the queen sort of cried. But the but King Vibhisara wasn't dead so soon because he was a stream enterer, so he has got very good um, mindfulness, concentration, wisdom. So he was doing walking meditation. He would see the Buddha at the at the vouchers peak through the window in the prison and give him a lot of faith. And uh, so Ajata Satu heard about it, thought that this walking meditation is maintaining his life. So he got someone to cut the, the anchor of the father and that resulted in him bleeding and maybe infection or something. And he died. The day he died, King Ajata Satu wife gave birth to his firstborn child. And when the, the, the ministers brought the news to the king, one is a good news, one is a bad news. He just, they didn't know which one to tell. So he says, you have a newborn son. And Ajatasattu was so happy. Then suddenly he feels so much love for the son. And at that point in time, he felt the love of his own father. And said that, let's bring my father, let's not kill, let's not let him die. Because he suddenly felt that he wanted to preserve his father. Then the minister said, I'm sorry, the second news is your father has just died. So at the moment, he was stricken with a lot of guilt. And from then on, he couldn't sleep. So according to a commentary, this episode was a usual phenomenon of his life. Every night, he can't sleep. When he sleeps, he will cry. He'll be stricken with guilt. And then um, he's very uneasy after he killed his father. Um, so, uh, and, and he has asked, and, and he has um, sought many um, teachers out. But of course, during those periods, Devadatta, subsequently, we all know he, he died, also went to hell. Uh, he tried to kill the Buddha with the, the drunken elephant and the, the rock down the cliff. Um, so anyway, uh, during this period of the sutta, the king already had a few sons. One of them was Udayabhata, which I'm going to share later. Uh, so the king on that night was so inspired by the beautiful moon and cannot sleep. He wanted to talk to someone, some kind of counsellor. But as a king, uh, who can be your counsellor? Everybody is your subject. And he did have asked a few counsellors. So he was asking, on a night like this, it would be so nice to talk to a teacher. And then he, he purposely mentioned this to Jivaka. Jivaka was his doctor, right? Jivaka was also the Buddha's doctor. Jivaka, and at that particular, these stories, uh, the Buddha was living in Rajagaha also at Jivaka Mango Grove. Jivaka wanted to support the Buddha, so donated a mango grove for the Buddhas to stay. And um, so the king knows that. So he's mentioned it. But Jivaka was very quiet because there are so many ministers, they're all following different teachers, you know. It's like they're from different religions. Better don't say, let the king, otherwise become very contentious. So one minister tell him, you should visit Purana Kasapa, you should visit the... Kesa Kambali, and so on. And the, Buddha, and the king just say, mm -mm, no, we, they don't know why. Then finally the king went to ask Jivaka, uh, what about you? You're very quiet. Why don't you offer someone to, for me to visit? Then Jivaka says, oh, 
you should you might want to visit the blessed one he's now staying in in the mango grove so um he he shared uh, the 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 blessed one is an arahan a fully enlightened samasam buddha um, pure in the conduct and his wisdom the teacher of gods and men um, the best trainer of people to be tamed is fully enlightened awakened you know so after hearing that the king was so inspired, you know, so full of faith, so happy to hear somebody like that. Arahan, fully enlightened, pure in conduct, pure in speech, pure in concentration, pure in wisdom, pure, you know, completely like uh, blameless. And so the king uh, wanted to visit and uh, asked Jivaka to prepare, um, I think, four or five hundred elephants so that all his wife can go along. So um, he placed his wives each on one of the 500 she-elephants, mounted the royal tusker and proceeded in the royal state, accompanied by torchbearers from Jaka, Rajakaha to Jivaka's mango grove. Okay? But when he reaches the mango grove, there was something very interesting. He was scared because according to Jivaka, there were 1,250 monks with the Buddha. And uh, how come he's so quiet? And uh, the king is very guilt-stricken and surely he must have been very insecure, thinking that everybody is trying to harm him. So he thought Jivaka could be trying to harm him. So he said something like that. Um, um, he says, uh, so when the king Ajata Satu came to the mango grove, he felt fear and terror. His hair stood on end and feeling his fear, and the rising of the hairs, the king said to Jivaka, Friend Jivaka, you are not deceiving me. You are not tricking me. You are not delivering me up to the enemy. How is it that from the great number of 1,250 monks, not a sneeze, a cough, or a shout is to be heard? So um, his guilty conscience is making him panic. And uh, Jivaka said that the Buddha like quiet, and uh, so he walked in to the front of the pavilion. And of course, in the, in the presence of the Buddha, obviously you can tell who is the Buddha and who are the disciples. And yet he asked Jivaka, where is the Buddha? Then the Jivaka said, he's sitting at the middle column. Then he went close. And at that time, um, the king went to the Lord and stood to one side. Standing to one side, the king observed how the order of the monks continued in silence like a clear lake. And he exclaimed, If only Prince Udayabhata were possessed of such calm as this order of monks. And then the Buddhas can uh, read his mind, you know, and also responded to his exclamation, Do your thoughts go to the one you love, Your Majesty? And then the king said, Lord, Prince Udayabhatta is very dear to me, if only he were possessed of the same calm as this order of monks. Then King Ajatasattu, having bowed down to the Lord and saluted the order of monks with joined hands, sat down to one side and said, Lord, I would ask something if the Lord would deign to answer me. Ask your majesty anything you like. Udayabhatta, according to the commentary, subsequently killed King Ajatasattu. He was also subsequently killed by his own son and uh, for four generations until the last one, the people of Rajagaha killed the last king. Felt that they, this family is just so corrupt, you know, one killing the other father. But, um, but I can see the king, also a father himself, looking at the peace of the Sangha felt inspired and wished that his son could be as peaceful as the as the as the um the, as the monks okay so so far for the story and uh, i'm going to now go on to all the fruits of samana pala and uh, so i'll go faster now <laughs> i realize i'm spending a lot of time on the stories okay um this is very interesting you may identify with this the king actually asked the buddha to this effect huh? There are many people, craftsmen, horsemen, and you can almost imagine in modern day, there are lawyers, doctors, uh, 
uh, people, uh, businessmen, um, technologists, IT programmer, drivers, delivery people, you know. By the, the work that they're doing, uh, they can feed themselves and feed their family. And by doing this, they are pleased with their work and also pleased that parents and their children and their colleagues are pleased with them. Okay? They are really deliver, they are being economically productive. Okay? And off and on, they may go to the church, they may go to the temples, they can give offering. So all these good deeds, they'll be reborn in a good place. So surely you can see, as a, as a lay person, just working is very good. You can see the fruits here and now. What is so good about being a monk? Okay? What is the fruits of being a monk? So how did the Buddha answer? Um, the Buddha asked him, you know, you've asked the same questions to other teachers? Um, then he said, yes, I've asked to six different teachers. I'm not going to go through in details, but just very briefly. Purana Kasapa preached the doctrine of non-action. There's no evil, no, no merits. Whatever you do is, you kill people, so there's no evil. Okay? No, no actions that has any result. Then Makala Gosala, he said that whatever you do, it doesn't matter. You be go round and round in samsara until you're purified after millions of aeons later. Whatever you do, you're destined to be purified. You can kill, you can steal, you can give dana, no meaning. Okay? The third one is uh, Ajita Kesakambali. He, he preached annihilation, you know. So um, when you die, it's ashes to ashes, dust to dust. All the earth elements go to the earth. All the water go to water. Wind go to wind. There is nothing. You might as well just kill yourself now. So that's um, Kes Ajita Kesakambali. Um, these three are related. Now, one is there's no result, no future. One is there's no action, no whatever you do, there's no effect. Another one is what the, both are don't have. Okay, these three are related. The fourth one is um, Pakuta uh, Kachayana. He talk about earth, water, fire, and wind, and then uh, life, energy, pleasure, and pain. These seven things are permanent. It's almost like an eternal material, an eternal soul, an eternal feeling of pleasure and pain. If you were to draw a knife and cut through, you're just separating the earth, water, fire, wind feeling of pain and pleasure and the life faculty. It continues on. It is established. So this is a teaching of eternalism. Okay? And then the next one is Niganta. Niganta believes that the world is so complex, you won't be able to understand. What you need to do is just to do restraint. So he is known as the one with the fourfold restraint. And the last one was Sanjaya. Sanjaya is very evasive, you know. If you ask me, I would say, I can't say yes. If I say yes, it may not be true. I say no, it's also not true. So he is like an absolute agnostic. Agnostic means things are not knowable. Okay, so these are the six schools that the king have visited and uh, about the fruit of the homeless life because they are all, you're all ascetics, right? You must be something useful about being an ascetic. Why, don't you, why, why, why is the difference between a lay person and being a homeless person? So they gave all this answer and he said that it's like, I'm asking something, they're giving me something else. And then the Buddha started to talk about the fruits of homeless life. And I think there are about 16. No? So I'll just share them and I'll just share with you as a modern day lay person, what did I learn from this sutta? Okay. The first and second are very similar. It's very materialistic. So the first one was, King, I suppose you have a slave. You know, day and night look after you. And uh, suddenly he realized that actually the king is a man, I'm also a man. You have got such good karma, everybody dote on you and you enjoy all the best luxury. I, I don't, so I better do something for myself. Then he shaved his hair, shaved his beard and become a homeless samana. Then he asked, Buddha asked the king, if a slave like this, would you still ask him to do your biddings, you know, do the things that you want him to do? No. If he become a monk, I would more than happy to dana and to support him. Then the Buddha says, see, this is the first fruit of the homeless life. So he's using materialistic argument to address his materialistic argument of 
fruit of a lay person. Because a lot of people, I mean, many years ago, my, one of my siblings, we went to uh, Mei Hong Son and see all this stupas, which is very ornate, some with gold. And then, and this sibling told me that, what is this, you know? They are so poor and yet they go and do this. Because you're from a perspective of pure economic productivity, you know? And then, um, so Buddha told King Ajatasattu this, the King Ajatasattu not satisfied. Is there another fruit? Yes, say a farmer or a worker, uh, your subject, and uh, become a monk, would you still ask him to pay tax or serve you? He say, oh no, I will dana and I will support him. He don't have to pay respect to me. This is a second fruit. But King Ajatasattu is not, no, I mean, is no longer focused on economic productivity because he's stricken by guilt. He's stricken by a psychological burden that no amount of luxury or money or materialism can satisfy. So he wanted more. Um, so the Buddha actually finally taught the real teachings, the more excellent fruits of recluseship. So he said, huh, if you would like to hear, I'll share with you the more excellent fruit of recluseship. So what is it? So the Tathagata arises in the world. He teaches the Dhamma, good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, and then taught the discipline. And then a, a householder or a son of a householder, having faith, having faith in the Tathagata, went to listen to the Dhamma, out of faith, ordained himself. Okay? He gains faith in Tathagata, and then endowed with such faith, he reflects. The household life is crowded, a path of dust. Going forth is like an open air. It is not easy for one dwelling at home to lead the perfectly complete, perfectly purified, holy life, bright as a polished conch. This is a key, okay? Uh, many years ago, I was in uh, Batu Pahat in a retreat with Bhante Vajira Dhamma. He always tell us to ordain. <laughs> and he always quote this, household life is crowded and is full of dust. Then, of course, at that time, household life is not bad, lah, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. Now I'm in my early 50s. It does feel sometimes, huh? household life is a bit complicated and complicating. Um, but that's another thing. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so, um, you see, you can practice as a lay person. You can also practice as a, a monk. Okay? And uh, this householder had faith in the Buddha who taught the Dhamma, reflected that household life is dusty and crowded. Why? So according to the commentarial text, so we, we all know commentarial text was transmitted to Sri Lanka during Asoka time, right? And, uh, and Buddha Gosha subsequently went to Sri Lanka, translated them from Sinhalese back to Pali, right? So it's from the commentary. So why is it crowded? So in the commentary it says, even if a couple, husband and wife, live in a house 60 cubits on an estate of 100 yojanas, I don't know how big is that, but imagine in a big house, husband and wife, how crowded can it be, right? So it's still crowded in the sense that it involves obstacles such as lust, etc., and impediments such as fields, lands, stocks and shares, bank account, uh, tenants, investment, business your employees or your employers. So all these make it very crowded. Okay? It is a path of uh, rising of the dust of lust. So this is what it meant when the Buddha says household life is crowded and full of dust. Okay. And when he goes forth, he has to keep the Vina year. Okay? And the Vina year, the Buddha described in three sections. The smaller, about 26 of them. The middle, about 10. And the greater section, there are seven. The greater section is related to different kinds of livelihood. And uh, in this particular sutta, what is beautiful about it is that uh, the analogy is very good. The analogy, you will see the analogy of what, how first jhana feels like, second jhana feels like, third jhana feels like, and also the hindrances, how they feel like. It's very useful okay, for practitioners. But this analogy 
is also very interesting for morality. So just as a head anointed noble warrior king, having defeated his enemies, sees no danger anywhere from his enemies. In the same way, a monk thus consummate in virtue sees no danger anywhere from his restraint through virtue. Endowed with this noble aggregate of virtue, he is inwardly sensitive to the pleasure of being blameless. So this is the third, ver third fruit of homeless life, the happiness of being blameless. Okay? Uh, because the virtue is pure and you feel secure, you can see that there's no bad karma is going to come to you. The virtues, keeping our precepts, huh, it's like setting a fence around us so that our enemies cannot reach us. So it's like a king after vanquishing all his enemies. Now he feels ah, finally secure. So that is the feeling of keeping the virtues. The fourth is a sense of sense restraint. So what was written in the Sutta? And how, great king, does the bhikkhu guard the doors of his sense faculties? Herein, great king, this is very important also to practitioners. Having seen a form with the eye, the bhikkhu does not grasp at the sign or the details. Since, if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the mind, evil unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the mind, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the mind. So from the eye, ear, nose, um, tongue, body, and mind doors. So these are the six sense doors. So you guard the six sense doors because every time you see something pleasant, you will have greed. You see something unpleasant, you will have aversion. Okay? Same for hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and mind object. If you are not careful, our mind is always blown left, right, center by the contact. So the contact is pleasant, we have greed. Contact is unpleasant, we have hatred. Where is the key? Where is the key? The key is in attention. You can see something, but if you att attend to the impermanent, the, the, um, the non-self, you know, the, um, the imperfection, you know, just don't grasp onto it as if it is permanent. If you grasp on it as it's permanent, it is pleasurable, it is self, it is pure, automatically either greed or aversion will come. Automatically ignorance will happen. Then you have to process it to make it wholesome again. Okay? But if your mind is always just touching, never really grasping, observing through the eye, ears, nose, this is how we restrain our sense doors. We guard it like this. Okay? And... Um, so endowed with a noble restraint, this is the fourth fruit. He has an unblemished happiness. The fifth fruit is mindfulness and clear comprehension. I think I won't read it. it, it may take a bit too long, but mindfulness and clear comprehension is repeated many places in the suttas. Okay? Mindfulness and clear comprehension, he is mindful and clearly comprehending when he walks forward, walks backward, extend his arm, or close his arm, go for arms round, eating, chewing, defecating, passing urine, mindfulness and clear comprehension. Okay, so this is the fifth fruit. But what is mindfulness and clear comprehension? Mindfulness, I mean, there are lots of teachings on mindfulness and you can search Google, Wikipedia, a lot of definition. But I like to go back to um, at least the Pali Canon. So mindfulness... In the, if you look at the Sutta Pitaka, you can't see definition of mindfulness. So you have to go to Abhidhamma, Dhamma Sangani, and also the commentary text to the Dhamma Sangani. So in the Abhidhamma um, treatment of the Buddha's teachings, they analyze it so that everything is put into very plain, um, uh, um, sort of uh, a, a, a plain explanation that can be aligned across different suttas and different pitakas. So mindfulness, and they use this instrument of the characteristic function, manifestation, and proximate cause. Um, uh, yeah, so characteristic of mindfulness is not wobbling. So when we say the mind is mindful, you're mindful of an object and the mind is not wobbling. 
okay, not floating away but sinking in on the object. And also mindfulness, you can also understand it in terms of its function. It is the absence of confusion and non-forgetfulness of the object. So when you're mindful of the breath or on a person or listening to the talk, listening to the Dhamma, your mind is as if everything you hear, you are not forgetting, you're remembering moment to moment. Okay? Manifestation to a meditator, mindfulness feels like a guardian, like a guardianship of the mind and the object. Of the object, for example, you're mindful of the a talk, your mind is guarding the talk as well as your mind at the same time. The proximate cause, how to be mindful, for example, mindfulness of the breath. You'll be mindful if your perception of the breath is clear. How to be mindful of the talk? If your perception, if I'm saying and it's clear to you, you can be mindful. But if I'm talking and then you feel that you don't understand this, this one is a bit confusing, all these Pali terms, it's very hard for you to be mindful. So mindfulness, the proximate cause is clear perception. And the four foundations of mindfulness is the body, the feeling, the mind states, and Dharma objects. Um, so, uh, um, so this is the definition of mindfulness according to uh, the Abhidhamma. Um, but what about clear comprehension? So it's also from the commentary. Commentary of the Samana Pala Sutta. Okay? So um, Sati Sampajanya. Sati is mindfulness. Sampajanya is clear comprehension. In everywhere you read, when the Buddha talks about sati, he talks about clear comprehension. What is clear comprehension? They are, uh, they are side by side. Okay, so um, the second line comes from Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, book on, uh, um, on the Noble Eightfold Path. He says, mindfulness renders a brief pause and open space for one to inquire into the activity at hand. And the inquiry is clear comprehension. And in what sense? There are four ways that you can clearly comprehend. This is very useful, I find, at work. Okay? Whatever you do, you're mindful, but also you need to be clear. What is the purpose of this? When you set up a company, you must have a vision and mission. Same. Okay? If, you want to, if you want to say, uh, uh, decide to go to this company and work, you need to know what's the purpose. Does it serve your purpose? What is your purpose? Okay? So clarity of purpose is the first clear comprehension. Clarity of suitability is the second one. Is it suitable or not? Does it harm anyone? Does it break any precept? Does it harm myself and others? This is the clarity of suitability. The third clarity is the clarity of domain or resort. So in the, so in the, in, in the bhikkhu's life, clarity of purpose is if you want to go for arms round, they need to be clear. What is the f arms for? Is to maintain this body so that I can practice, right? And if I go to the village through this route, is it suitable? Oh no, there are a lot of crowd, there's a market, there is a lot of entertainment. I should go by this route. So the clarity of suitability. Clarity of domain or resort is always having the meditation object in mind. So say if he's practicing sensations of the body, okay? So when he's taking the arms foot and walking, he's always mindful of the sensations of the body, like how Ajahn Brahma Wangso taught us just now. Or if his object is the breath, if he goes for his arms round, he's always clearly mindful of the object, which is his breath, okay? But maybe he's doing uh, vipassana, Okay, which is a fluid kind of mindfulness plus samadhi. So he would be, okay, maybe before he set off, he just go into deep concentration. Once he emerge from deep concentration, your mind is very clear, the mindfulness is very strong, and there is moment to moment some kind of samadhi, and you take the arms, foot, and then you observe the movement of all the material phenomenon, and then you check your mind, there is mindfulness and there is wisdom. The wisdom is the clearly comprehending why am I doing this for? Is to preserve. This is loathsomeness of food. Food is very hard, you know, it's very difficult. People have to prepare, they have to swallow and it comes out of feces. So they reflect this way. It's like eating the flesh of my son, traveling through a desert. And he walks, walks. This is not suitable, I should go that way. This understanding is wisdom faculty. Then he continues to walk and he sees the wind element pushing him forward and there's earth element as the feeling on the ground. So 
And then when he feels a hunger pang, then he feels that aversion arising, aversion passing away, aversion against aversion. So he can feel the feeling of uh, unpleasant feeling as well as the mental phenomenal aversion. So he continues to walk. So this is how the clear comprehension of domain depends on what are you practicing. I suppose in day-to-day -day life, the domain, I understand it as, I mean, I'm a doctor. Why am I a doctor for this, this purpose, right? Good karma and also uh, uh, right livelihood and also serve many people, purify the paramis and uh, um, maybe related to past lives. I have to continue to do this. Suitability, okay, is, doesn't break any precepts. Domain of practice, that is evidence-based medicine to me, okay? And then the nature of things. The nature of things is the clarity of the truth. Whatever you do, the mind is always clear. It is not me that is walking. It's a skeleton covered in flesh and skin. And it's actually just these four elements propelled by the mind to move forward. And this movement is also sustained by food that provides energy for you to move forward. So this is always perceiving the truth and or always seeing that it is impermanent suffering and non-self. So, say in modern day, uh, if we were to practice clear comprehension of true nature of things, is say as a doctor, you know, uh, he came as a doctor. So, we, although it's like clarity of purpose, suitability, domain of practice, but you also know that you can only do your best, you know. Sometimes the patient recover or not is not up to you, right? And when you heal somebody successfully, it could be partially you, but partially his own immunity and karma and his family and, uh, and his resources, you know. So we know that there is impermanent suffering and non-self, whatever we do, so that you don't feel so personal about so many things. So that is the clarity of the nature of things. So this is mindfulness and clear comprehension. So this is another fruit of the homeless life because they practice this every day. Okay? The sixth fruit is the simplicity of contentment. This is very beautiful, um, especially the analogy. A monk uh, only has a rope and his arms and he can travel anywhere. So it's like a bird with two wings and the wings are his only burden. So this is the sixth fruit. It is the simplicity's contentment. What about the seventh fruit? The seventh fruit is very interesting. So after he established in virtues, restrained his sense doors, practiced mindfulness and clear comprehension, having contentment in his heart, he find a spot and sit down, establish mindfulness in front of him. That's when he begins his practice. If we talk about five hindrances, we are really talking about samatha practice. Okay? In Samatha practice, the five hindrances are gradually suppressed. And the analogy of the five hindrances is very interesting. The first hindrance is the craving for sensual pleasure. It is as if a man were to take a loan and apply it to his business, and his business were to succeed so that he could pay back his old debts and would have enough money left over to maintain a wife. He would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. So for some people, they in they borrow money, start a business, then pay until maybe 20 years later, the debt all finished and then he start to get real profit. Then he feels so happy. So that is as if suddenly your first hindrance of craving for sensual pleasures is gone. The craving for sensual pleasures is like we're always indebted. The second hindrance is the ill will and hatred. It is as if a man who was sick finally recovered. When you are stricken with ill will, ill will and hatred takes many forms. Anger, of course, is a gross one. Depression is another one. Okay? Unhappiness is a pleasant, unpleasant feeling, but there's a dislike or any kind of dislike, including dislike of something that hasn't happened. What is that? Fear. Okay? So fear, anxiety, depression, anger makes us sick in the mind. So when your Practicing of samatha, your ill will is gone. Ha! Huh, suddenly, not, not sick anymore. So that is how it feels. The third hindrance is sloth and topper. It is as if a man who has been locked up in a prison for a long time, then subsequently he was released. And, uh, and all his possession was not lost. So this is as if a person have abandoned the third hindrance of sloth and topper. 
sleepiness and drowsiness is like a prison that's making our mind not free. Okay? Fourth hindrance is restlessness and worry. Restlessness and worry is like we cannot settle. It's described as like the wind blowing the leaf, right? So it is as if you're a slave, no independence, subservient to others, have to do this, after that, have to do that, then have to do that. That is restlessness. Okay? So suddenly, don't have to be a slave anymore. That is the release from restlessness. And the last one is doubt. How is doubt like? Doubt is like a merchant with lots of money walking in the desert. And the relinquishing of doubt is as if suddenly you see an oasis as a village. Ha! Ah, finally safe. I haven't lost anything. So doubt is like you're very uncertain. Then the release from doubt is like, oh, finally done. So that is the, another fruit of the homeless life is the overcoming of the five hindrances. Then the mind is pure. The mind is pure, need not be jhana yet. Huh? So in the Visodhi Magga, when you overcome five hindrances, you're really excess concentration, upachara samadhi. Okay? Uh, this is good enough for a lot of people to practice vipassana because the five hindrances is the one that prevent us from seeing things as they really are. Okay? Um, so to overcome the five hindrances is a very beautiful thing. But the Buddha talked about even deeper happiness, which is the practice of jhana. And uh, this description is very good. One day if you're practicing jhana, you can remember this description. The first one is the first jhana. How does first jhana feel like? Um, a skilled bathman uh, kneading a soap powder, sprinkling with water, forms from it into a metal dish and basically just create a soap. And then it is sufficiently wet all around and become a cake of soap. So that is how it's like. And there are five jhana factors of applied thought, sustained thought, joy, bliss, and one-pointedness. Okay? So the mind is very steady, and the water is the joy and the bliss. Okay? And being kicked together is applied thought and sustained thought. The mind is like, keep thinking, and it's stuck there. Okay? So it's like a piece of cake. Second jhana, how does it feel like? It is as if a lake in a high mountain. Okay? It never increases, never subsides because there's a spring from the bottom. Keep filling the water. So in the second jhana, letting go of vitaka vichara, applied thought and sustained thought, the mind becomes like free from applied thought and sustained thought. It becomes really, the joy is even deeper than the first jhana. So it's like a high mountain lake and the spring from the bottom keep rising. This spring is like the joy. Okay? Third jhana, how does it feel like? The joy is a bit disturbing. So in the practice of the third jhana, you reflect on the disturbance and the um, joy. Joy is a little bit like the hindrance. May there be, may, the, may I let go of joy. Then you go back to the object and then the mind sink into a very, very deep state of calm. And when you examine it, there are two jhana factors, bliss and then steadiness, the ekagata, the one-pointedness. The analogy in Samana Pala is like a lotus in the water, bathed inside, outside, everywhere is all water. So this is the feeling of the third jhana. Fourth jhana, how is it like? Fourth jhana, you reflect that the bliss, the happiness is calm. It's still a feeling. Feeling is a bit gross. No? May I have no happiness? Then let go of happiness. The feeling, it be, still there, but it is neither happiness or, un or unhappiness. So it's very, very still. No, very, very still. Sometimes it feels like you're, you're frozen inside an uh, uh, iceberg, for example. But in this description, uh, the Buddha described it uh, like a person after a, a bath, bath, and then he's wrapped from the top of his head all the way to the feet uh, with with clean, dry cloth. So that is the feeling of the third, fourth jhana. So these are the fruit of the homeless life. Okay, so these are the two jhana factors of the fourth jhana. And what more? There is more, okay? So this one is the ultimate, the inside knowledge. So when the mind is concentrated, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines his knowledge to envision. 
this is my body having material form composed of because this is important to remember having material form composed of the four elements originating from father and mother built out of rice and gruel impermanent subject to rubbing and pressing and dissolution and dispersion okay this is my consciousness so this is the body and then this is my consciousness supported by this body bound up with it and then the analogy is also very interesting a beautiful barrel gem of purest water eight faceted well cut clear limpid flawless and dealt with all excellent qualities and through it there would run a blue yellow red white or brown thread and a man with keen eyesight hold it in his hand and know that this is a gem and there's a thread that runs through it so this is the analogy of inside knowledge so what did the commentary says the first section where it talks about the mind is very pure and malleable this is when one has attained to very good samadhi okay samadhi such as the jhana samadhi and in the commentary is also um, the eight meditative attainments which is the eight jhanas the four material and the four immaterial jhanas and the 14 ways the 14 ways uh, is described in the visuri maga practice of the kasina meditation there are 10 kasinas nine of them can go all the way to the eight jhanas okay so you have to practice forward backwards and you jump from one kasina to another from one jhana to another so that is the 14 ways of practice that means uh, in the practice of samadhi it is for the mind to be so powerful and so malleable and so wieldy that it is very useful for you to use it for deepening your knowledge and vision so there are so much words here i'm um yeah i think i'll just tell you what i was reading and what i wanted to share with you the knowledge and vision is really um uh is inclusive what is inclusive here is really already realizing nibbana at this stage um but also the various inside knowledges and um the barrel gem when you when you use deep concentration and analyze the body you can see the the body is actually just four elements and if there's concentration some people see the body like crystals okay and then there's a mind that's observing all this and that is the threat is the inside knowledge inside knowledge is part of the mind the mind always have a consciousness and then when you have wisdom that's inside knowledge you also have its contact its feelings its perceptions and all the other mental factors so that is the thread that runs through it there is no soul okay it's basically just material phenomenon the body if you use inside knowledge and look at it it looks like a gem and then you can see that this body continue to evolve and change from one life after another and then there is this thread that runs through it which is the mind that continues on when he talks about the material phenomenon which is born from father and mother which is four elements which is fruit uh, sustained by food this is the cause of sustaining the material body father and mother means you are born you are reborn in the human realm it includes the understanding of dependent origination in this understanding of dependent uh, of inside knowledge and the fact that you have to rub and do that means it is dukkha and it is impermanent it's, it will fall apart so it is through this arising and passing away you understand the origination and understand the cessation of this nama rupa the five aggregates so this is the inside knowledge okay. yeah um i'll just skip the rest but but after this is that all for the fruit of the samana pala you know you already start to see inside that this body is just like that nothing special there's more okay the tenth is the knowledge of the man-made body he can create a body out of this body okay like a sword out of a scabbard okay in the commentary text this body is my mate it is just like you but you cannot hear cannot see okay it doesn't have the sensitivity in the body okay i based on this commentary text some people say this is astral travel it doesn't look like it 
And then there are many knowledge of supernatural powers, such as can walk on water, can go through the mountains, can fly, can uh, one become many, many become, uh, or one become two, you know, you can, you can split. This is another fruit. Another fruit is that you can, you can divine ear, you can hear the human realms, you can hear the deva realms, distant or near. Okay? It's like you're in a place as a marching band, you can hear the cymbals, you can hear the, the, the different kinds of drums. And then you can read other people's minds. All these are based on Samatha practice, the 14 ways of using the Kasina meditation. Um, they are optional. We just know that the most important is for us to understand the insight, knowledge and vision of path and fruit, uh, of enlightenment. Um, but according to my teacher, some of the, the supernatural powers are useful to acquire, such as the divine eyes and then the re recollection of your past lives in details because it can deepen your vipassana knowledge. You can really start to really see deep disillusionment and start to understand that your, the karma is so strong. Divine eye is, um, is, is the understanding of why people arise in this realm. Where did they, what was the karma that caused this? Why they come into heaven, human or anywhere? What is the karma that caused this? Mind reading maybe is useful if you want to be a teacher. You can actually see whether your student's mind is pure. I don't know. I don't practice these things. So, but, but, um, but these are the teaching of the Buddha. And we read it respectfully. And uh, it's not for vanity. So there's nothing evil about supernatural powers. So supernatural powers, some of them are really useful to deepen our vipassana. Wisdom and wisdom, there is wisdom and there are wisdom. Okay? Wisdom, if you just listen to a Dhamma talk, there's wisdom. It's also wisdom. You practice deep concentration until jhanas. You emerge from jhana, also got wisdom. But it is nothing compared with the wisdom of deep vipassana understanding of impermanent suffering non-self throughout life after life after life of samsara and also of others' lives. So to have deep wisdom, psychic powers can be helpful. Okay? So this is the knowledge of the recollection of past lives and the divine eye. And finally, the highest fruit is the, is the supernatural uh, abhinya, okay, the higher knowledge of knowing that all your taints have been destroyed. There are three taints huh? here, taints of um, sensual desire, taints of existence, and taints of ignorance. So all of us, as long as you have the taints, you will be in samsara. Okay? As long as you have a craving for sensual pleasures. Um, so even a second fruit of enlightenment, a sakadagami, still have this. Taints of existence, anagami, still have this. Taints of ignorance, arahan, don't have anymore. So this is when they realize, when you look at it, it's like the analogy is like somebody in a high mountain lake, which is very pure. Look at the lake and can see these are the pebbles, these are the prawns, these are the fish, like that. So this is the highest fruit of the homeless life. And after that, so I'm finishing already, um, King Ajata Satu was so inspired. You know? He was so stricken with panic and guilt for so many years, cannot sleep, want to see an ascetic, but because of his shame, he don't dare to see the Buddha. He met with six other teachers and none of them can satisfy his quest about the purpose of things, of life. Okay? And, and finally, he met the Buddha. The Buddha initially shared with him something maybe materialistic that he may like, but obviously he wants more. And the Buddha shared with him everything, okay? the, all the fruits. And then he was so inspired, he knelt down and then he, he said that he has done something really bad. He killed his father, you know, so he would really beg forgiveness from the Buddha. And the Buddha said something like, it is good that you repent. And the person who repent 
we will support the sasana, you know, the, the holy life. And uh, we accept your repentance. Um, so with that, apparently, Ajata Satu, after that, could sleep forever. I mean, could sleep well. <laughs> and, uh, but of course, he killed his father. He, at, upon his death, he went to hell. But the Buddha said, he'll go to hell, but if he had not killed his father, after this talk, he would have been a stream enterer. But because he killed his father, he had to go to hell. But after he emerged from hell, many, many years later, he would become a Pacheka Buddha. Oh. So, um, even Maha Moggallana also almost killed his parents. Huh? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I think um, nobody is beyond uh, redemption. Nah, huh? No matter what kind of bad things that we've done, it's important to be forgiven uh, by ourselves. And uh, repentance is the practice of being true, right? Being honest, practice of wisdom. You know, we forgive ourselves. Even with the suffer, nothing is permanent. Okay. So some of the reflection of a modern day disciple, which is myself, the psychological burden of breaking precept to achieve success. So it's a warning to all of us. You know? Like the king, I uh, want to be a king, kill his father. Even though he achieved whatever he have achieved, but the psychological burden is not worth it. Okay. Existential quest. The why questions in our lives and the sustainability of different beliefs of our times. Um, existential quest is quite common, especially when one is, um, uh, is uh, disabled, old, maybe suffering from dementia or cancer. Uh, some of them can don't know how to express. They just say that jalau bo ing or that you give me a needle so I can die. You know, they may tell you these things, but what they are really trying to say is, what is the meaning of life? Okay, and um, so you may have all of us have got these questions lah throughout our young days and adult days, but and then we read so many books, listen to so many YouTube TED talks and. And there are many kinds of values. Some values are not sustainable. The examples given in these suttas are those that talk about um, uh, annihilation, materialism, there's no future life, no past life, no karma. You know? All these are, if everything is all purely uh, utilitarian, okay, it's useful in the present life, it may not sustain you when you're old. If, say, for example, some people believe that the meaning of life is to be useful. What if one day you're not useful? Or that if you may have some relative or a son or a daughter and you think that they cannot be a useful member of the society, then how? So the belief system is very important. So choose one that is sustainable. Try the Dhamma. Of course, we are all converted. So. <laughs> Yeah, the Buddha's teaching is pure, okay? It's sustainable, it's universal, okay? I mean, recently, I don't know whether you all read an article a few Saturdays ago. Some people, their teachings cannot explain certain things and they cannot see out of it, no? So, um, so it's important uh, for us to, to, to understand the Buddha's teachings deeply and rightly, okay? How the practice answers the why question. So um, the practice, uh, you can see, is about precepts, it's about concentration, it's about wisdom, it's about uh, the joy of contentment, blamelessness, and so on, and use different energy. So even though Ajata Satu asking about purpose from a perspective of a lay person, okay, I do all the good things, what? And then I, I gained money, rightfully gained, and then supported my family. I supported the bhikkhus and so on. Is that good enough? And the Buddha talked about there's more to it. You don't have to postpone this to your next life. You can enjoy it now, okay, by this way. The gradual progression of the practice. So this is a basic framework that is compiled many years ago that I 
did from uh, Anguttara Nikaya, Majjhima Nikaya, and so on. So um, in the Buddha's description of uh, uh, a good disciple, he talks about establishing faith, virtues, generosity, and wisdom. And in other place where he talks about wisdom, wisdom can be acquired by um, listening, by contemplation, and by practice, right? And when you practice the, to gain the wisdom, what do you actually do? You practice in terms of the three trainings. You keep the precepts. When you keep the precepts, you establish yourself in the uh, first, first training of morality, but also the three factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, right action, right speech, and right livelihood. And with this as a basis, you can practice samatha. Okay? Samatha is a practice of tranquility or calming of the mind. With that, you are actually putting in action the three path factors of right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration, also satisfying the second factor of the three training. And with concentration as a basis, you practice vipassana. And with vipassana, you can see things as they really are, you acquire the right view and then the right thought. And in the Rata Vinita Sutta, in the Majjhima Ikhaya, this was described in the seven stages of purification. And if you look at the Samana Pala Sutta, the faith, so t we begin with faith. Okay? We, so where does faith come from? Faith comes from so many sources. We listen to this teacher, that teacher, the teaching, read the Buddha story, then slowly, slowly we acquire faith. Because of faith, we continue to read even more, to listen, to contemplate, and to practice even more. So this is, the Buddha used, the t um, when he talked about how the whole thing starts is when a Buddha arrives in the world, preach the Dhamma, and then the disciple have faith. Okay? So when there's faith, they can start to, um, so this is the first and second fruit. Okay? And then, um, virtues and sense restraint is the third and fourth fruit. And the mindfulness and clear comprehension, contentment, overcoming the five hindrances, as well as the jhana, the fifth to the eighth fruits, is related to the teaching of concentration. And when it comes to wisdom, it's the ninth to the sixteenth fruit of insight knowledge, the higher knowledges, and the destruction of the taints. So these are my references. And may all beings realize the fruits of the homeless life. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu. Fantastic and inspiring. <laughs> Very powerful talk. Thank you, Dr. Ng. Can I ask if there are any questions uh, from the floor? <laughs> Sorry, it's quite a long talk. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's yeah, fine. Yeah. Uh, I would have sat here for another hour. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Ng, uh, maybe I can start. You know, uh, for a lot of us, especially in Buddhist fellowship, um, we focus a lot on Anapanasati. Yes. So uh, a lot of breathing meditation. But from what you were talking um, from your talk, um, I, I had a thought that um, for a lot of us, actually, breath is difficult. And sometimes, you know, um, uh, some members might be happier doing even metta or just focusing on the joy of giving, dana, or even four elements yes. or parts of our body. So um, how do you suggest we find our, the best meditation for us? Yes, uh, thanks for the question. Recently, I also had that question. <laughs> okay, how we practice uh, is that we go to the teacher and usually in a traditional way, we have to stay in for a week or two or three or even a month or years. Uh, Brother Po would know. So we go for a retreat, right? And teacher usually wants you to do one object. So um, uh, my teacher usually start with Anapanasati because the Buddha uses it himself. And, uh, and Anapanasati is generally um, useful for a lot of people. But after a few months, uh, if like, you're not happy with Anapanasati. Sometimes she will ask you to do skeleton. Skeleton, how we do it is, um, have you seen skeleton? Yes, okay. Imagine that skeleton is your skeleton. Recall the image, okay, then you just visualize the skeleton. Then gradually, skeleton, 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 skeleton. Sometimes you only focus on the finger skeleton, bone, or the spine, or the skull. Also good, you don't have to see the whole set. But you can also see your whole 
skeleton sitting cross-legged on a cushion. That's also good. So that is skeleton. Some people, she will teach four elements. Four elements is, um, what is earth? Earth is hardness, roughness, smoothness, heaviness, lightness, uh, and uh, hard, rough, heavy, soft, smooth, light. Okay, These six characteristics of the body, the gross sensation, you can just feel the sensations, but you can also analyze the sensation into those things. These are the earth. Then the water is a flowing and a cohesion. The wind element is a pushing and a supporting. The fire element is a hotness and a coldness. So she will also teach that for some people when they are not happy with the breath. Then some people, they have got the breath and they see the light, but they cannot progress further to have deep concentration. I noticed that she also asked them to use the light, spread it to all in the whole universe, focus on the part in front and absorb on it. So this is a light casina. So I also noticed that some people when they're meditating, they'll use a plate from our kitchen, put in front of them and meditate on the plate. It's actually not the plate, it's the white colour. The white to expand, expand to the whole universe and then focus on it in front, that's the white casina. Um, usually that. She will also teach metta as well as death meditation as a basic kind of daily practice. Um, uh, not for the jhana, but to soothe the mind, to become happy. But also, death meditation gives us priority. Oh, actually, after, at the end of the day, we are going to die. So nothing is really worth clinging on to. So those practices are day-to-day -day one. But for, for samatha practice, this is how she would do. But what do we do now? Okay, we're not in a retreat. We practice breath. We don't see any progress. So one way is maybe you should seriously go for a retreat. Because Samatha practice needs... In the ancient time, people stay in the forest, like, you know, under a tree, in a cave. I mean, to really do that, you need to be quite far away from duties and sensual pleasures. So you really need to do some... You need to invest time to practice Samatha like that. And uh, so only after that, then you think that breath is not for you. But uh, I was saying recently, I have my question about this. In Every Wednesday, um, we have this group on Zoom. We used to gather at Dr. Ambing Chu's place, Qigong meditation. But every time we sit, everybody's doing Anapana. Then I somehow felt, maybe we should do something different. Maybe they, they may not like Anapana. So I started to experiment no? with 32 parts of the body, um, skeleton, four elements, now we have just finished the casina, so I use some web picture like casina, like coming through the leaves in the forest, then expand. So I use guided meditation. Some of them have got very good result, you know, with fire, with earth, and with skeleton. They will WhatsApp me and say that oh they got this and that. Then so I think uh, maybe can I don't dare to say this, I'm not a qualified teacher, but uh, we can, you may, I mean, in a day-to-day -day life, it's good to understand there are different objects, but to really know what is really good for us, uh, is you need to invest time in a retreat, and then a teacher will guide you. Uh, so, um, yala. so I'm experimenting with my friends, doing different ones, and there are some successes. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's very inspiring. Um, just to share also, I, I, I quite enjoy um, just rubbing a piece of rock. Hmm. The solidity, the earth element. Also, yes, yes. It's also coming. Yes, yes. Yeah. If you focus on that and you realize that that is roughness, heaviness, smoothness, there's also lightness, heaviness, and all that is there. That's earth element. But even in that rock, there is wind element, there's water element, there's also fire element. It's very interesting. Yeah. Wow, oh, indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions from the floor regarding your meditation practice, uh, the suttas? It's such a clear and inspiring talk and uh, certainly, certainly has motivated us to meditate more. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Can we say sadhu again three times? Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you for the opportunity to practice meritorious deeds. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So we perform um, 
a lot of meritorious deeds today. We paid respect to the Buddha. Paying respect to the Buddha, Dhamma Sangha, is a meritorious deed. We took trouble to come over here to join the fellowship to partake in a service. This is meritorious. We listened to the Samana Pala Sutta, the second of the Diga Nikaya, a very important sutta by the Buddha. It's very meritorious. And we took precepts just now. Keeping precepts is meritorious. Whatever, we might have broken it yesterday, but just now we were clean again. So this is very meritorious. We practice meditation led by Ajahn Brahm on the sensations of the body. It's very meritorious because the mind was very wholesome. And, um, and I was uh, doing my best to share the Dhamma. And I did the research for the last one week. And uh, there's a lot of merits there. And I'd like to share it too. So uh, we would like to share all these merits with the departed relatives of our members. So the first is um, Mr. Anang Majuke, okay. and then Mr. Anthony Suwati, uh, Mr. Hatha Winata. Okay. So let's just dedicate merits. Huh? Okay. Merits to, our depart to the departed and all sentient beings. So in Anjali position, let us invite all sentient beings to participate in our acquired merits. Etavata cha amhehi Sampadam punya sampadam Sape deva anumodantu Sapa sampati sitya Etavata cha amhehi Sampadam punya sampadam Sape buta anumodantu Sapa Sampati Siddhya Etavata Cha Amhehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sape Sata Anumodantu Sapa Sampati Siddhya Dedication of Merits Let us dedicate the merits of participating in a wholesome Dharma activity to our departed relatives and friends. Idam me nya dinam ho tu sukita ho tu nya tayo. Idam me nya dinam ho tu sukita ho tu nya tayo. Idam me nya dinam ho tu sukita ho tu nya tayo. End of service dedication. I dedicate the merits which I have accumulated to the cultivation of my mind in order to bring happiness and benefits to all sentient beings. I dedicate the merits to my parents, children, spouse, relatives, friends, colleagues and my adversaries, wishing them long life, good health, happiness and prosperity. May we never part from the triple gem and may we always walk the path towards enlightenment. Closing homage, let us pay respects to the Triple Gem. Arahang Samma Sambuddho Bhagava Buddham Bhagavanta Abhivade Swakato Bhagavata Dhammo Dhamma Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Sawaka Sango Sangang Namami Sadu Sadu Sadu